All righty, we are ready to go with our continued GMS summer panel series. Uh, this week, thanks to the folks at Apple TV Plus for bringing it to us uh, and bringing us some really amazing composers and supervisors talking about their collaboration. My name is Jonathan McHugh on behalf of the Guild. We'd like to welcome you all. Thanks for coming. Um, we're again, we're doing these uh, weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, uh, certain weeks. And if you'd like to know more about it or tell your friends about it, have them sign up at the Guild of Music Supervisors.com under Friends of the Guild. For only $100 a year, you get to know everything we're doing and be part of all our world, which we'd love to have more of you all in there and um, learning about what we do. So again, thanks for Apple TV, Emily Lou Aldrich for helping to put this together. Uh, we are blessed today to have a amazing moderator who doing a bunch of these. So she's, uh, she's still plugging away. Um, so I'd like to welcome the artisans editor of Variety Magazine, Jazz Tanke. So Jazz, throwing it over to you to kick off things. Hi, Jonathan, and thank you so much. Thank you to everybody joining. And we've got a great audience from around the world. So thank you. It's late in London and Ireland. I've seen you, you know, I see you uh, pop up in the chat. Um, thank you to Apple TV and Emily for arranging this. This is going to be such an exciting panel because we're looking at the collaboration between music supervisors and composers, that beautiful relationship that brings you the incredible music that we hear in TV shows. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to let everybody introduce themselves um, and let's start with Liza. Tell us, you know, what you do and the show that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. How's it going? <laughs> um, I'm Liza and um, I'm with Carter and we worked on the morning show together and we started working on season two and then everything stopped, but we're very excited to be here and it's a great show and that's about it. All right, Carter. Yeah, I'm, I'm Carter Burrell and uh, I was the composer on The Morning Show. That's the first television experience I've really had. I've done films um, for most of my career, uh, but it was a really uh, awesome way to start. Uh, and when, as Liza said, we were just about to begin uh, season two when the um, the pandemic took, took everything down. But, Hopefully it'll happen eventually. Thanks, Carter. And Zach and your amazing vinyl collection behind you. Hey, I'm, I'm Zach Cowie. Uh, I'm a music supervisor. Um, I worked on Little America with Michael Brook, who's over there. Uh, I'm new to Zoom. It's nice to know that my social anxiety uh, works digitally as well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I'm the, we're in the same boat as Liza and Carter. We were about to start season two, and then everything got put on hold. But uh, very happy with season one, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Michael, you're also a Zoom. You're also new to Zoom, right? I'm a bit of a Zoom virgin. This is my first time, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm the composer on Little America. Um, uh, worked with Zach for the second time, which was another great experience. And we we're also on hold. Uh, but I don't mind because I, I probably for Zach last year was just as crazy as for me. And I'm glad to have a bit of a break, actually. But anyway. What about you, DeVoe? I'm DeVoe Yates, a music supervisor. I worked with uh, Ian and Sophia on uh, Dickinson. Uh, we finished season one, obviously, and then we just finished season two uh, about, a bit, about a month ago, I guess. <clears throat> and finally, Ian and Drum and Lace. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Ian Holquist. I'm Drum and Lace. We made it just in time. <laughs> We're the co-composers on Dickinson. Thank, thank you all for, for joining us. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, being in quarantine, some of you started the second season. Are you actually enjoying the slowdown right now, or are you working at? Are you working ten times harder right now? Uh, let's start with you, Zach. Well, I um, <laughs> this has been a, an interesting year. I had a, a, a detached retina in January, so I, I went blind in my left eye and had to get a bunch of surgeries and 
was quarantined for that for like two months. And then I had three weeks of everything being normal and then this quarantine. So it's been a wild one. Uh, but I was going to have um, three shows that were all shooting uh, April, May. So everything's on hold now. But, but as Michael and I were joking about earlier, like I'm a runner, a cyclist, and an audiophile. So my daily life hasn't changed very much. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, what about you, Drum and Lace? I know you're at home with a young baby. So talk about being in quarantine and being at home with the baby. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've, I think everyone's been kind of sheltering in place in quarantine for about 13 weeks and we have a 12 week old. So that's how, um, my life has been (laughs) for the past little bit. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, just as Zach said, like we, we had kind of expected to be somewhat isolated and quarantined anyway, now kind of for at least April and May. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we didn't really have that much lined up and we wrapped Dickinson right, like literally the week that um, baby girl arrived. So wrapped that and then we wrapped um, another show and then I wrapped a feature film like all the week that I was due. So I kind of was ready to have these next few months off, but it is a little grim because I was like, oh, I'm going to jump back in and the summer and it's going to be great. And now it's like, you know, we'll see. But so, but the baby's been the big activity. Yeah. Oh, congrats. Yeah. So I'm going to jump to you, Carter, because for those tuning in, we only have Carter, the luxury of Carter for till 3.50. So let's talk about working on the morning show. This was your first episodic TV uh, session. So talk about how that differed from working on a movie score. I, you know, was, I was figuring out that difference as we went along. And I'll first say I haven't completely figured it out. But, uh, you know, the, the most obvious difference is that there is no end. When you see, when I work on a film, I usually have read the whole script. Maybe I've seen a cut of the entire thing. And I have in my mind where I want to get to when that film ends, what I want the music to have done to the viewer, like how it's added up and um, uh, into one cinematic experience and with um, the show um, I think when we started I probably only read the first four scripts or something I'm not sure they knew exactly how it was going to end at the point which I began the show Um, and there isn't by definition episodic television doesn't have an end now this particular season had a pretty significant conclusion but um, but and that's true but I have to say I was only I just had my fingers crossed the themes and concepts I introduced in episode one would actually pay off at the end of episode 10. I didn't really know how episode 10 and and so I couldn't really be absolutely certain of that. Um, So that's very different. It's very more like, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Um, Yeah. Talk about the collaboration process that you had with Liza between, you know, between Liza putting in the songs and then you deciding where to put the score in. So talk about. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say same with me, even, I mean, I'm not a a composer, but even as a music supervisor working on a new show where they're, they're, they're starting out, you don't know exactly where it's going. You know, you just really have to listen to the filmmakers, see what they're putting in there um, in the scripts. You know, some songs are scripted, um, and then and and just listen to their direction and try to like feel your way through it because it's yeah that's so true Carter. Um, go ahead and uh, no. Well, the, so the collaboration was basically we were together at spotting sessions. Um, it, I live in on the East Coast, but I would fly out. We would do um, four a day. <laughs> we would spot three or four episodes at a time uh, with the producers and editors, whoever was involved in those episodes. And I would say what she was thinking of for the song opportunities. Um, I would throw out ideas about uh, score, but um, sometimes it would take weeks or months for that all to gel and finally be decided. So we're, there's a constant conversation back and forth. So what are we thinking about for the song spot? And I'm constantly sending music ideas, which I assume Liza's hearing, I'm not sure. But it's um, 
it's a constant bubbling uh, of information back and forth. And, and as she said, finding our way, uh, it never stopped right until that, that last episode, we were just as I think figuring it out as we went along as we were in the first episode, just, um, you know, but that's the exciting part of this kind of work. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like, um, it's super obvious. Oh, it's a score spot or it's a song spot. Sometimes it could go either way. So you're both trying, we're both trying to solve the, the spot and make it work for the story and emotionally. Yeah. What was the typical turnaround time that you had for an episode for score wise and, and music song wise? Well, score wise, it was, um, it was to me a little uh, odd, but that's episodic television, which was new to me. I probably spent three months on the pilot and then one week on each of the subsequent episodes. So that has to do with the fact that they were just, everyone involved was trying to find the tone of the show. They were trying to figure it out. And we, I could say we almost basically exhausted every possibility before people would finally sign off. And in the end, they signed off on what were basically my original ideas. But there are so many producers, there are producers that I'm working with, but so many people I would never even meet, people at Apple, Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston are producers, and they're all, you know, sending opinions and thoughts and what have you, um, that's their job. But it meant that going through all of those until finally everyone had said, yes, these are going to be the themes, this is gonna be the tone, this is gonna be the instrumentation. Getting that agreement on the pilot took a really long time. And all that time I'm looking at, wait, when is episode 10 due? And the <laughs> days are going by. Um, and in the end, we have like one week to do every subsequent episode, which, okay, to me, that seemed a little crazy. But um, it's a complicated business, and as I say, it's a process. <laughs> Did everybody else find that same tight turnaround in terms of ep in, t in terms of delivering your episodes? Let's start with the three months part. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we di we didn't get three months for a pilot, but it was, and and also our show was something we we kind of realized as we were going, as, as Carter said, you figure it out as you're going, but every episode was completely different, completely different story, no connection to any of the others. So there was no thematic, you couldn't build anything thematically. It was, it was really like eight independent movies. Yeah, was fun. In that sense too, I think um, there's still that kind of like tuning of the orchestra moment where you're trying to figure out the sound but with Little America for Michael and I, since it is um, an anthology series, we were sort of trying to figure out the formula. So, because each one is different, but you kind of want a through line to all of them. So there's a there's a a, a sound to the show. How did that work on um, Dickinson for you, Drum and Lace? Um, so we um, Ian and I got brought on a little bit later in um, kind of in the process. Um, so essentially we started, I think really kind of diving in, in January and then we wrapped by end of March. So we spent, I think a little bit of time on the pilot, but we, because a lot of the episodes were already shot, we were able to start working with DeVoe and with Elena and just kind of trying to figure out, um, the sound kind of jumping around episodes. Um, and you know, Dickinson is a 30 minute comedy you know like dramedy but comedy so there's not as much music as there is in the morning show or even a little america so i think that all in all um we maybe it was maybe like a week and a half per episode but then they were it was kind of like spaced out over time wow wow devo if you want to add anything to that i feel like you were on the them a lot longer than we were uh you know it, it, like everybody else says it was just hard finding that sound at the very beginning and uh, you know we tried all kinds of different sounds for the score and you know we kind of tempt with like instrumental pop songs to kind of get the vibe we were going for but uh it really helped when uh Gemma and lace and uh, ian came in and they really just made an amazing score for the show uh, i think the first thing you guys did was the death theme right yeah i, I think so yeah yeah which we had kind of modeled after um a song by the prodigy so like the working title was prodigy for it and yeah. we just had we were hoping that it would be that you know elena and that everyone would like it and thankfully everyone was like okay let's go with this and see where it goes so i love it um 
Carter, let's go back to talking about Alex and Bradley. They're such different women when we first meet them. So talk about how you wanted to approach their theme and their cues and what the music said about them, those characters. Well, the, basically the very first scene pretty much is where you see um, um, Alex wake up at 3.30 in the morning, which she does every day to go to work. And, the, um, and there's no dialogue. She, but you spend uh, several minutes watching her morning routine and she ends up uh, in a, you know, being driven to, to the um, show. Uh, and what I, you know, what we want to do is establish the idea that this is her every day. That's not a special day. This is her every day and that she's been doing it a long time. Uh, and of course it's there in the way they shot it and Jennifer's performance. But I also, I wrote what we call an ostinato. This just like note that just repeats and repeats and repeats through the scene. It's make it seem like, yeah, this is a routine. What you're watching is a routine. And maybe it's also like, routines become boring. Uh, and um, so, you know, that was basically how I begin and how I began with her character. Um, then with Bradley, she's sort of exactly the opposite. She's a, a, a person who doesn't have really a routine and prefers to, um, you know, ignite every situation she comes into. So I, uh, I began with sounds that I thought were actually <laughs> really sort of, um, Drastic, these, these very highly processed instrumental or um, synthes, synthetic sounds for her. They would also point up how completely different a care, personality she is, because uh, that's part of the, the um, chemistry of the show, is that these two people who are forced together, like it's sort of like two different atoms in, a, uh, you know, in an experiment, they're forced together, and, um, and it, it, you know, it's um, dangerous in some ways. So I had this completely different sound for her that... Um, I think when Reese first heard it, she was, she, it really annoyed her uh, that I was, you know, had these aggressive, nasty sounds under her. So I did, as I said, got notes from her and had to explore every other option. And then in the end, you know, we came back to the really nasty sounds, which I thought really worked well for her. But, you know, I think she didn't want her character to be presented the first time she appears on screen in that way. But it is actually, I mean, I think it works narratively and dramatically. And those are the situations you, you know, you run into. Um, I'm not used to getting notes from the actors. It just so <laughs> happens in this case, the actors are the producers. So they're allowed to give me their notes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm aware of the time, Carter, and I know you have to go. So thank you so much for thank joining us. It was, it was great to see you all. Bye, Carter. Bye-bye. Bye, Carter. Thank you for making this record. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Liza, let's talk talk about episode five. So, for those, hopefully, people who are tuning in have seen the show because we're not doing any spoilers. Um, but in episode five, there is Sondheim. There's Gershwin. It's a little Broadway c tribute. Um, talk about how easy it was to get clearance on Broadway show tunes? To be honest, we didn't really have any trouble. We just, um, you know, when, so of course we started working on this episode during the script stage because, you know, all the songs are scripted and are, you know, part of the story and there's gonna be, they're all going to be filmed. So we have to make sure they're ready to go ahead of time. Um, there was between the script and then, you know, the absolute final, there are a lot of timing changes. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth with the licensors um, about, you know, timing changes and that kind of thing. But um, it, it worked out fine. But I don't, you know, we, we I, I don't know if it was because uh, we have amazing, huge star power in this show, um, but we didn't really have too much trouble uh, getting the clearances. Okay. Well, we're about to see a clip. Do you want to introduce a clip from it? Sure, yeah. I mean, basically, um, this is from Sweeney Todd. Um, this is actually, you know, it's a cocktail party. It's a fundraiser that Alex, Jennifer Aniston, is hosting at her penthouse in New York City um, to raise money. Um, and 
So it, it's the theme of the evening is Broadway. And um, so there's tension between her and Corey. Corey wants to, yeah, I hope I'm not spoiling anything for anybody. <laughs> Corey wants to like, he's the head of the network. She's the host of their main morning show. Uh, Corey wants to get rid of her. But so there's a lot of saccharine irony here. Um, Alex does not want to do this song with him. Uh, she finally can't take it anymore. She joins in to duet with him and then it takes on this other kind of meaning because it's a great song um, and uh, another meaning for her. Somebody asked in the chat room just now um, about the grand rights, if we had to clear the grand rights, but um, no, we didn't because there was no uh, <clears throat> performance of the actual, you know, there's no, you know, no, what do you call, you know, like no costumes or actually recreation of the original as, as it was in Sweeney Todd. So we did not do the, need the grand rights. Um, and I also want to know, like, a lot of times when you're doing pre-records and uh, sessions with, with vocalists, there's a lot of vocal coaching when you have um, big actors or just actors or cast members on camera. And we had a lot of vocal coaching sessions on this one. There were quite a few, quite a few, more than I've ever had, like at least three or four. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Devote, talk about, I mean, you have, you know, Billie Eilish, Lizzo, Nick Cave, like what were the challenges for you for sourcing those different artists? I mean, for me, it was a bit of a challenge just because I have, I, I normally work with shows that are a little bit retro, so I think we wanted the show to be very current in terms of the music, and so I needed to kind of uh, really uh, invest myself in current music, so that was kind of my challenge, I think. Yeah. What about um, you, Zach, like for Little America? Um, well, I, I, uh, music supervision, I guess, is kind of like my third life, third career. Um, for a long time, I worked for record companies, um, and I've been a DJ that um, I've, I've toured around internationally since I was a teenager. And through all this, you know, I would just be in all these places and start collecting all these records. And I'm very, very interested in international music and finding stuff from all around the world. So when I got the call for this show, I was so stoked because they showed me the list of countries. And I had like at least familiarity with every every spot listed. So it was almost like, um, I don't know if I could have done this job if I didn't have that 20 years that came before it. Um, so, <laughs> so I was just like ready to go. <laughs> Michael, how did you approach this? I mean, you've got your, you know, you've had such a long career and an amazing one too. So, you know, Little America is an anthology. Um, talk about your approach to this. Well, I think one thing um, that became apparent, uh, even though each show is people from a different culture, um, in the score particularly, we, we never wanted to explicitly acknowledge that very much at all. It, because it gets like sort of like your cheesy copy of somebody else's cultural of their music and um i think maybe the the fact that i'd done quite a few uh, cross-cultural collaborations when i used to do albums um m that decision was already partly made that to not go to that territory where you do sort of fake ethnic music so it was really um there was sometimes a very mild acknowledgement of of geography in, in what we did musically but I think mostly it sort of simplified the path that we we really were just going emotionally and 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 sonically, not, not particularly uh, any genre or style or or culture. It, it also just with with the source music, with a lot of it being from each country of origin, um, that kind of did that job. Yeah. Then let Michael just focus strictly on emotion. Although we did like throw in a couple instruments from the different places. But yeah. you, you 
dealt with them very tastefully so they weren't like fake world music. <laughs> Talk about the mix of like, it's a period show, but the music is so contemporary. Like, um, you know, did you feel that freedom when, you know, in conversations that you were having with the producers and the directors? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that was, that was Alina's vision was to, uh, you know, have modern songs there to kind of make it relatable to, you know, modern times. Um, and, uh, you know, usually in the scripts, there were songs noted for certain scenes or moments, but they were usually just kind of like just guidelines, like an idea of like the lyrical content or the vibe that they were going for. Uh, except for two occasions. One was uh, Give It Away by Andrew Bird in episode four. And then this song, um, which was originally supposed to be ASAP Rocky's uh, Wild for the Night. Um, but as I remember at the time, there were some clearance issues with the track. Uh, and Alina had gone so, so far as to like take, uh, you know, period dance videos, of, you know, formal dances at the time. And she had kind of cut them to that ASAP Rocky track just as a, demo of kind of what she wanted the scene to be like so that people had an idea um but you know there were some clearance issues so we had to like pull together some alts uh, and this is what she chose yeah and i think you've described this score as you know a deconstructed pop song which i love it was like it's such a great description um what was the inspiration behind some of the more pop oriented sounds to the score um, so I think that what DeVoe had worked on and kind of what was there when we got the episodes uh, was really, really helpful and trying to figure out what sound we wanted to go for. And ultimately, I think, um, because we get asked this a lot, I think kind of like the three main avenues of inspiration in terms of references were on one end, we were really inspired by kind of like electro rock, like kind of something like Phoenix, you know, kind of like that sound that, because it's just got a lot of energy. Um, then, as I mentioned earlier, kind of like a more 90s drum and bass um, prodigy type harder sound mixed with a little bit more of contemporary hip hop. Um, and then we kind of went into more like, I mean, I think our main inspiration was Missy Elliott for like kind of like the third avenue of stuff. So, you know, if you think of the show and you've heard the soundtrack, like we hope that you can hear a little bit of all of those pieces in that, as well as being very considerate of what, um, what had been pulled for each episode. So, you know, it had mm -hmm. to be consistent. Like, for example, like DeVoe mentioned, um, episode four has a little bit more of an organic feel in terms of like the, um, the, the, the music that was in there and the, um, and stuff. So even our score is a little bit more organic in that sense. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I think, that episode in particular, it's like we kind of follow their adventures a little bit. Like that one, they go out to the woods to see Henry Thoreau. So like the music kind of takes on more of like almost like a camp woodsy vibe. Um, but then, you know, other episodes like the party episode we just watched, uh, our score is fully electronic all the way throughout to kind of sit better with a lot of the electro music that comes in. Yeah. Was that always part of the discussion about the show to always have to have like current music and contemporary music? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, when Alina and I first talked um, before I actually got the job, I made her a mixtape of kind of, you know, ideas of what the show could sound like or what I thought it might sound like. And uh, they were, you know, just all current tracks. And uh, that was just kind of what she, what she wanted for the show. Yeah. What was, what's, in terms of, you know, composers on the composers on the panel, this is a question for you all, but like how talk about your journey of getting into going from, you know, film to TV composing. Um, should we start with you, Michael? Let's start with you, Michael. Um, well, it was a rocky beginning for sure. <laughs> I started a couple of TV series a few years ago and it was a nightmare for me. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, started working on the show, um, The Fosters, and then, uh, which became Good Trouble. And that was just, it was just so great. It's one thing I really like about, and then um, Little America was fantastic. Um, that's different about TV is just the, the pace of the work and um, the fact that 
uh, there are deadlines. Uh, sometimes in film, you know, they'll they'll say to you, "Great, we just found another two more months that you can work on this," <laughs> and you go, "Yeah, I'm kind of, I think I'm sort of done." Um, yeah. But uh, and you work on it for two more months. Um, but also, I just think there's something I really miss um, is working with people more than once. Uh, or, you know, separated by long periods of time. And um, I miss that from uh, the recording world where I often would work with a, a group of people and we do multiple projects. And something I really like about TV is, you know, you get to know each other and you you get a, um, uh, both a sort of shorthand for communication, but you you understand each other better. And and I I really find it makes the, the music better when when there's a kind of, a depth of the relationship that you have with the showmakers. Yeah. Ian, Sophia, do you want to add to that as composers? Yeah. Um, I think Dickinson was actually like a really our first time doing proper narrative TV and we kind of got thrown into it as well, but we were super excited and the show was so bizarre and crazy that it was inspiring to work on. But I think we also realized, at least for me, like I actually really enjoyed the TV process. Uh, along with Michael said, I, I do so many indie films and documentaries that they just go on forever. And it's kind of nice to have like, these are the months that you're going to be on this project. And when it's over, it's over. And everyone, it, it was almost like school. Like we finished right before spring and then we were off for the summer. And then, you know, last fall we picked up with season two and again, just finished in the spring. Um, and it, 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 I like, I think I really like being part of a team. Uh, where, you know, sometimes on bigger films, you have that, but not on every film. And I feel like on TV where you have someone like DeVoe and you have a music editor and you have the producers and you're kind of like in daily communication with them, it really kind of makes you feel like you're part of the process, uh, especially because we all work from home now more so than ever. It, it feels really good to like feel like you're actually collaborating with people. Yeah. And it was really nice um, to also, you know, in, in films, you get to develop themes, but you don't always get to develop them as much as you want. Whereas for Dickinson, now we've gone to kind of devel develop themes and develop kind of instrumental palettes over the course of two seasons. And it's just been so exciting to be able to do that or be like, oh, let, we're writing this theme. Let, like, let's bring the viewer back to like something from episode one. Or, you know, there's so much more fun and kind of stuff that you can do, which was really, really um, great to be able to do on a TV show. So. Yeah. Liza, was there a particular song? Were there actually were there any songs that you wanted that you couldn't get, or was that not the case when it came to the morning show? I, mean, I don't remember. Um, I'd have to look through my notes. Um, hmm, not sure. Not okay, sure. actually, then let's talk about Kelly Clarkson. So, what was it about? You know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. What was it about that song that just made that the anthem? And was that easy? I mean, well, she appears in the episode, but. I mean, that is another example. I mean, she, I, that was the writer's um, idea to, to put Kelly Clarkson in the script. And when I read that, I thought, uh-oh, how are we going to, you know, make this happen? And, I, and so we asked and she said, yes. I mean, it was, I, I. It wasn't hard. I don't know. I, I, for some reason, I thought that was going to be impossible and not work out or something like that. But it just, it, she wanted to do it. But yeah, that was something, you know, from the writers that they scripted to make that storyline work. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, what were the challenges, whether in composing the, you know, the score or putting the song palette together for your series? Let's start with you, Zach. Um, I think, you know, when I, one of the trickier things, like going back to the question that you just asked Liza, um, we really did end up getting everything we wanted um, source-wise in Little America, but it, some of it was just like a clearance nightmare because a lot of this music has never been used in film and TV. Um, a lot of these like deep international tracks and, uh, I really put our clearance guy, Charlie Haggard, who I love, I put that dude to work on this thing because there, there were like, 
I mean, some of the heavier detective work I've dealt with, and, and I tend to, on all my shows, use kind of weirder music, but this was, this was the toughest. Uh, so just obtaining the rights to these things, tracking down the people who were, who were the ones who were going to sign off on. Um, but how much fun, Zach? I mean, that must, you know, I mean, being able to work with music from around the world and all that detective work, really, it, it's, it, uh, it's it, fun. It, it is very, very fun. Um, but going back to what we've all been talking about with TV, those deadlines, um, it can be a little maddening to, to, you know, present something to everybody that they love and then be like, can I swear on this, by the way? <laughs> yeah, we're not on the... I think you yes, can. I, I'd say you can. <laughs> hey, fuck, now I've got three weeks to find this dude, you know, wherever he is. Um, so that, that got really tricky. Um, but a, another comment on this, like, the difference between film and TV, um, time-wise, I actually love the, the deadline of TV. Um, I'm, I'm a big jazz nerd and, and really kind of live by that first thought, best thought idea. And um, I love on TV that we don't have time to try every single thing. Um, we just find the thing that works and ship it. And I love that. I couldn't agree more. Amen. <laughs> it's not, it's not that we're all lazy. It's, it's that, it's um, there is some magic when you first uh, find a piece or get an idea that works. Um, boy, do you, and I'm sure all of us have had this experience where you kind of chase that forever, and then you come back and you go, you know what? The first one is the best one, and it's not always, but it really often is. Ninety-five yeah, percent, <laughs> and it makes the the process. Uh, it, it feels like you get some momentum and there's some emotional excitement about what you're doing. So I'm all which, for that too. Which goes to the point of like not overthinking stuff. I mean, I think that's one of the main things about music supervision that's important that, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people say, what went into this decision to figure out this magic, you know, and, and to both of your point, it's like uh, if you try really hard sometimes you're trying too hard i couldn't agree more like when you catch the feeling you're done and uh every time in fact every time that i've like done the you know deep dive like work on this thing forever i never find something i like it it, it just it shows <laughs> up it shows up like right when you see the scene or right when you see the script and um yeah. and i love it and and I, I almost become like an outside observer to my own process because I don't even know what makes me think of this stuff. So it's so, it, it is like really exciting. Yeah. So this is a question for composers. Is there anything, when you're switching from going from film work to TV, is there anything that the music supervisors can do to help or assist in that process? Like, did you get much advice on your work. Do you mean notes from, or do you just mean? This I mean, is not answering the question. Yeah, like I guess notes. It's it's an audience question, so I'm guessing they mean like, did you get notes or advice and on how to how they could approach a series? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Um, I, I think for me, uh, the more communication they can provide, the better. Um. Uh, on our show in particular, Elena Smith is so brilliant, but she self-admittedly will say like she doesn't really know how to talk about music that well. And sometimes trying to decipher what her notes are took a couple people <laughs> to figure out. And uh, especially like on season two as well, where we, without giving anything away, like we kind of branched out into doing some original songs for the show as well. Um, I think having DeVoe there as a support system for us was infinitely helpful. Yeah, Devo was our, like, literally our middle person. And it, we, we wouldn't have, I don't think there would have been a season two musically without Devo for season one. So yeah. we're extremely grateful for the, you know, and as Ian was saying, it becomes a team where it's like, you're not just emailing and then you're texting. And then I feel like we've gone a few weeks at a time talking to Devo like every day being like, yeah, so what 
is Zelina mean by this? <laughs> but we made it. We made it through. <laughs> yeah. So I have an audience question, another audience question. Are there any go-to music libraries that either Zach, Liza, DeVoe uh, look to first when it comes to sourcing tracks for your shows or just tracks in general? Let's start with you, Liza. Well, I mean, I don't, I definitely have them. I mean, I, uh, I use a lot of them. I don't really want to say, you know, cause I don't, cause I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Devo. Um, I, I tend to use APM a lot, um, for in terms of library music an extreme, I think. Um, those are kind of my go-tos, I guess. Those are good. What about? What about you, Zach? Um, really, just you know, just like anything else in this job, I'll use whatever works right. So, um, this show, uh, even though it was, uh, you know, it's on. I don't think Zach uses library music, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I use a little bit of it, but uh, this this show, I mean, this is actually maybe something interesting for. Um, the audience to, to realize is this show is on Apple TV plus, but, but, uh, uh, we're produced by NBC universal. And that, that's the case for a lot of these shows, you know, it's, um, two kind of separate spots. And, uh, when you work on an NBC universal, um, show, they have this, this like master library search thingy. I think it's called like frequency. And, uh, and it, it allows me to search, all the libraries that they have deals in place with. So a lot of times, um, I don't even know where, it, you know, I'm not looking in one place for something. I'm just looking for like what works. And then the, the program will tell us where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to music supervisors out there tuning in and composers tuning in on, on your collaboration? Like what's the thing that makes it so smooth and well, I, I have to kind of give big props to Michael Brook because as he uh, alluded to earlier he has done a lot of really pretty important cross-cultural records and, and Michael knows music very very well uh, and I, I don't know how to play anything that's why I have all these records <laughs> uh, so what was wonderful about working with him is he understood my references even if they were like obscure I could mention some crazy Nigerian artist and Michael would know who he is so that that's the way that I communicate and it worked so well with Michael because he had the vocabulary and weirdly enough our music editor Richard Henderson he did too and um and it was kind of like a bit of a miracle that these three nerds find themselves in this one place. We all spoke the same language already. So it's really, it's really finding that shorthand and um, just, that's it. That's it. The shorthand came very quickly with Michael and I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that um, like it, it went just, slightly going back to the difference with film and TV, um, there can be a difference and sometimes there isn't in the role of the music supervisor, but I've worked on quite a few films where I didn't even know who the music supervisor was. Um, they were in somebody in New York who maybe picked some songs or something. I, I, they had zero involvement and that wasn't necessarily a problem, but um, when, when you have a music supervisor who uh, becomes part of the process, it can, re as um, I think uh, Drum and Lace or Ian were saying, they can really help uh, with the communication. And also they're kind of um, trusted by both parties. And mm -hmm. so I think that can really help the producers. Um, they, they sort of, they feel that it's not just the composer trying to push some idea on them. The, the music supervisor thinks it's a good idea too, or also the music supervisor can, often it's, they'll come up with suggestions that I, I've, I've sort of reached a dead end and the producers have reached a dead end. And I, I, I find often they're real, um, 
sort of log jam breakers that in a creative way that helps immensely when when it's needed and when they're up to it um so little america <laughs> is an anthology series um each episode uh based around a uh, different main character and chronicling their uh, immigration into America from their country of origin. So this, this episode is about Igwe Buna, who comes from Nigeria to the American South in the early 80s. And kind of the, the formula that we cracked for a lot of these episodes was um, you know, representing in the source music the country of origin, in this case, Nigeria, um, but also representing the sound of whatever America they're showing up to. So it was a, this was an absolute blast for me because I got to combine like, I brought props by the way, <laughs> like Waylon Jennings and the Lijadu sisters, that hasn't happened. And that's exciting for me. Um, so I am a huge fan of the Lijadu sisters. Um, I work, Yay, me too. <laughs> I worked a lot um, on a compilation reissue uh, series by a guy called William Anyabor. Anybody knows him? Yay. Um, here's some uh, original Nigerian Anya Boy records. Yay. <laughs> so I met the Lijadu sisters through um, David Byrne and uh, my friend Eric at Luwakabop when they were contributing to a uh, William Anya Boy tribute concert. And I DJed the show and uh, hung out with them. And they're like magic. They're, they're the kind of twins that they like alternate words when they talk to you. And um, they wrote on my record, uh, this is not the last time our paths will cross. <laughs> Flash forward like seven years, I'm working on a Nigerian episode of TV and they were like, you know, a, an obvious first choice. And uh, in very, very sad news, um, uh, Kehinde, uh, she passed away weeks before the show came out, oh my God. but she got to see it and she was very, very, very proud of it. Um, so going back to what Liza was saying earlier, like that's, that's a huge added benefit to doing this job is, um, you know, they, they'd never had their music anywhere before. And uh, we got to do that. And we actually used them twice because the, uh, when I, played the, the, the group for all the producers, they freaked out. They're like, we got to use tons of this. <laughs> <laughs> How cool. Yeah. So how do you find inspiration for your projects, whatever, whichever one you're working on? Obviously, Zach, you know, you've got such global, you know, you go globally for your sources, but what about um, the rest of you? Um, yeah. Liza, Devo, let's start with you. Inspiration? Um, I mean, it just kind of depends on the project. Like, um, for instance, like Righteous Gemstones, I just, you know, really delved into gospel and country and just almost like it was like a PhD, just <laughs> try to like listen to as much of it as you can, you know, and just really get in there and uh, spend all day, every day listening to it and finding the gems, you know. Um, yeah. I watched uh, not just, uh, you know, collecting records, but I watched tons and tons of movies. Uh, and, and I've been known to, you know, borrow a few things from movies that I see. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's it's great. Like, I don't know about you guys, but the Criterion Channel like has oh, yeah. been nonstop over here during quarantine, and um, you, you can get a lot of ideas by just studying people who are way better at something than you. <laughs> It, on the subject of the Criterion Channel, is it harder to get songs from like, you know, the 30s or 40s versus getting some like Billie Eilish or Lizzo or Little Wayne, like? It can be, I mean, it's all, it's all case by case. Um, you know, the, the music business that we're in right now is kind of designed to get their songs into TV and movies uh, and commercials. So a lot of contemporary stuff, it's a phone call away to figure out who will take care of this. And some older stuff, depending on its obscurity, gets really difficult. But you also have to remember that so much music from the past is, is even if it's on a weird little label, it's, it's a subsidiary of a major label. 
um, a lot of times you have to kind of remind the major label that they own this stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and that's, that's this other thing that like, if I didn't have the, the life I had before this, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of this stuff. But I worked at record labels for 12 years and kind of know, um, we always say, I know where the bodies are buried. Like I kind of know what catalogs went where. Um, so it's, it's all totally case by case, but I'd say, I'll speak for myself, generally speaking, the newer stuff is much easier to figure out how to deal with. Also, I would add, like, for instance, like a, take a Duke Ellington song like uh, Sophisticated Lady or something like that. He recorded it for a bunch of different labels. Um, so a lot of times, like, what if your showrunner uh, rips it from YouTube and then you think you, you know, you think you've got the right master, you license it. And then you realize once you deliver the correct cleared file to the music editor or something like that, that it's a different master. And so that can be one of the pitfalls of, of music from the fifties and before that's kind of tough, but. Anybody wants to know this is the best version of Sophisticated Lady. Oh my God. <laughs> and what label is that, Zach? Right over there. <laughs> what label? Uh, well, this is an amazing, amazing record. It's uh, Masterpieces by Ellington. This is one of the oh, first. Yeah. Okay. This is one of the first recordings ever put to tape. Um, done in like 48, came out in 50. And it's like the best sound you'll ever hear, uh, sonically. Anyway. We planned that. <laughs> His visual A, like we talked about that ahead of time, right? We can LinkedIn for life, everybody. How did that happen? Oh it was God. sitting right here. Weird. I do want to talk about the death theme on, on Dickinson quickly, um, because what was the, we hear it obviously in the first episode and it comes back at, later on in the season. So talk about what you wanted to do with those versions <laughs> um well so so we we knew that we wanted to do something that tried to be as cool as the character of death was which you know is played by Wiz Khalifa and he's just so cool and he's got so much swagger and you know Emily Dickinson Emily's just so in love with this character and what he symbolizes that we had to find something that fit within um the sound of the show the contemporary sound of the show but also had that bit of you know i hate to, to use the word sexiness but like a little bit of sexiness a little bit of danger um and also you know s sound like a song so um we we just i think we just kind of dove in and um it was mainly it's it started off with a bunch of just analog drum machines so um i think i was like programming my um my Tempest drum machine and just kind of trying to come up with sounds that sounded a little bit old school, kind of like, you know, cause a, a drum machine like the Tempest, you can't swap out samples. So it's like the samples that are on there are the things that you use, which is why like an 808, for example, is like so recognizable because it's just, it's just a sound. Oh. So I think that using the drum machines and using analog gear really also helps to kind of cement a specific type of texture with things. Um, and we wrote kind of like a longer suite, a longer like sweet version first, which then we kind of cut down um, in the different episodes. Like in episode one, you first hear it as like a little teeny tiny kind of like comedy sting. And then at the end of the episode, you get to hear the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then we went as far as on, I think it's episode nine. Yeah. We did kind of like a another version, which I, I don't know if you'd call it like more romantic. It's just a little bit different. It's like sad rock version yeah and it's like <laughs> a little bit more like sway you know to kind of fit with um the drama that happens in episode nine um without giving anything away and um and yeah i mean it, it was a really fun theme to work on and getting to use samples and i don't know yet do you want to add anything else no that's pretty good yeah <laughs> <laughs> so last question one of the last questions um, what advice would you give to people trying to get into either music compo co composing or music supervision? I'm going to start with you, Devo. What advice would I give? I mean, one thing that's really helped me, I feel like, is learning Avid. Or, uh, so usually, you know, 
they'll send me cuts that are dry and I'll cut the songs or, you know, temp score in sometimes. And it just really helps me kind of like uh, wrap my head around the scene and like the beats, you know? Uh, so like, I don't know, that's been helpful for me, I feel like. Michael? Um, my, my impression is that all the composers I know and, and many I know of, everyone seemed to have a radically different path into scoring. Some people were in bands, some people were assistants to other composers. Um, some people were, uh, they went to school and studied it. Um, so in terms of getting into it, um, it, it seems as there's a huge number of ways you can. And it, it's, in, in that sense, it makes it hard to give people helpful advice. Um, just work on it. And then uh, as soon as, it's kind of like if you can get anything closer to that goal, no matter how sort of much of a detour it seems to be, just do that. Because it, I don't think there's a formula for it. It's not like becoming a doctor or a lawyer. You know, the, the path there is very clear and what you know, the credentials you need and all that. But, um, you know, uh, for film composers and TV composers, it seems there's everyone has a, a significantly different path. Yeah, is that? Um, I, well, I agree with Michael that that um, you know I, I didn't I didn't set out to be a supervisor. I, I literally <laughs> fell into it, um, and and I get you know I'm sure all of us supervisors get asked this a lot. Like, how do I start? How do I start? And and the only advice that I can really give is. Um, is to just study as much music as you can get your hands on, which has never been easier than in the age of availability. Because, um, you know, you, you go in there with, with sort of a, uh, you know, maybe a, a quality standard and, and a bit of a, you know, a, a taste level, but it's always the projects that pick the songs in a way. Like you, you see the footage, you see the scripts, those things make the decisions and the job as a supervisor is to just pick the best version of the thing that works, that moves the story. And the more music that you know, I, I think of it like a, you know, it's, it's like different colors of paint. And the more music you know, the more paint you have. And uh, so I, I say to everybody, just like study, 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 study. Um, and in, it, it, when that's the move, um, you'll be ready for whatever project they put in front of you. Yeah. What about you, Liza? I mean, it just what those guys said, totally. I mean, there is no set path. Uh, we've, we've talked about this on these calls before. There's like, everybody has a different story. A diff I mean, I got into it through poetry and spoken word and working on a poetry documentary and realizing that it was a, a, an actual job to put music with, with poetry in a documentary. So it's like everybody has, you know, and I've been a DJ, you know, I've, I know people, I mean, I am still a DJ. I've been a DJ forever. It's just that, you know, I, I have friends that came to music supervision through being an attorney or, uh, you know, there's just, there's no formula. I, I just think the only way to approach it is kind of like what Zach was saying, just like uh, listen to music, like pretty much while you're awake, you're listening to music <laughs> and then, um, and learning and discovering and asking questions. Okay. And learning about music. So you have your, your palate uh, to work with, but then, then volunteering to do anything and, just pretty much anything for anyone in terms of, oh, I'll clear that song for your, uh, your internet project or even for your Instagram thing or anything. Just do whatever you can to learn how to clear music and, um, and one thing leads to another, hopefully. Yeah. Ian, Sophia? I was going to say on the composing side, um, I'm going to let Ian talk about how his experience as well. But um, personally, when I, you know, like Ian and I both went, we went to school for scoring um, and that's where we actually met. But then in terms of kind of getting into it, you know, it's very daunting when you're like, okay, I want to be a film composer. How do I do this? And in my case, um, 
I kind of chose to focus on something that I knew I had, was very passionate about and that I thought that I could kind of start with. So I specifically set out to start scoring things for fashion. So it was one of those things where it's like, I love fashion. I'm not good at, I can't draw to save my life, but I was like, I think I can understand how to translate these textures and these ideas of these like collections into music. So that really helped because all of a sudden, you know, and it was a lot of cold emailing, a lot of reaching out to brands and to designers, but you know, once you do a few for, for free for, you know, the nice thing with fashion is that they can give you product in exchange, which, you know, is some kind of form of payment. So, you know, you're broke, but at least you're dressing well. Um, and before you know it, you're, you know, you've got a resume built of music for picture and, you know, from there, then you can start reaching out, you know, if you're still in college, then you've got the advantage of like, there's possibly like a film program happening. So you can do that. And I don't know, I feel like specializing and just kind of like keeping your scope, not necessarily super broad for me helped, but I know that a lot of other people, the, the broadness of the scope is what ultimately is better because then you get to work on any number of things. Um, and the thing that I like to say is just like, because we get asked a lot how to get into scoring is honestly, so much of it is to just be a nice person and to just be someone who's That's like dependable and reliable and like, yeah, you know, be honest. If you can't make a deadline, like tell them, don't let the deadline go by and ghost them. You know, it's just so much of it is just being a good human being with your other collaborators. And I think we see that a lot of people don't necessarily do that, which is very puzzling, but you know, you want to build good relationships with people because then you end up working with the same people often. And I don't know, I'm, I'm done talking. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know what else I can add to that, but I think what, it, what everyone said is totally accurate and spot on. It's just, it's a matter of knowing music. I think from the composing side, at least for me, it was almost more about studying film than music. Uh, like I went to school for music and we, our, our job is to write music, but our job is to write music for film. And film was actually kind of like the passion for me. It's just, I didn't end up in film school. I ended up in music school. So I think kind of having those two and knowing them equally well is where, you know, you're able to do what's being asked of us. And yeah, that's really it. Do any of you, you talked about your playlists. Do any of you have any to share on Spotify? And if so, where can they find you? Totally. Go for it, Liza. I, I, I love my, because like, because um, on KCRW, I'm not on the air because of COVID and they're just using a couple DJs at the moment. Hopefully I'll be back soon, but I've really been like just getting into making playlists. So I have a bunch, uh, but if you go to Mad Doll Mix on Spotify, you can uh, take it from there. Cool. Anybody else have a Spotify to playlist to share? I've got, um, so this is kind of a, a strange thing, but um, I've, I'm always really careful to have um, my own kind of private musical life outside of this job um, as, as almost an, an exercise to preserve my love of music. Because sometimes putting so much business around it can start to wear you out a little bit. So I, I collect all sorts of music, but, um, but I do a, a radio show on NTS in London that's almost exclusively stuff that would never work on TV or movies. So awesome. Tons of experimental music, ambient music, um, just weird shit um, as a way to just like make sure that, that I still have my musical world um, while I'm building one for so many other people. Yeah, and I, I riffing off of what uh, Zach said, I feel like for me, having the performance side of things is really important because it allows for me to kind of establish my sound separate from film. And what's yeah. been great is that the sound that I do for my own music has then been what I get hired for, which, which is really amazing because then it's like you put out this body of work and then that's how people find you. Um, but anyway, uh Digressing. Um, if anyone wants, I have a bunch of playlists up on just on Spotify under Drum and Lace on my artist profile. So if anyone wants to check those out, including a Dickinson one that has the music that um, was pulled, you know, like the syncs and the score. So amazing, amazing. Well, 
Devo, Michael, did you have playlists or? No, um, I, I don't. Um, I just, uh, I, I either am focusing on something and it'll just be a couple of albums. Um, also, um, I found in the last few years that I'm just working on music 10 or 12 hours a day for so long that uh, my appetite for consuming it is reduced. It's not I dislike it or I don't care about it. It's just um, I'm not hungry for it at that at that time. And um, so I actually don't really listen to much music these days just because I'm, I'm music that I'm not working on because I've been working on it so much. <laughs> I end up in that same position a lot. I just get so burnt out. It's like, I don't want to listen to anything. I just want silence. Yeah, yeah. you're saturated. <laughs> yeah. Kind of what I was alluding to with my, the stuff I do on NTS, it's, it's basically non-music. You know, I always <laughs> like to have something playing, but um, it, it's really important. I, 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 I've talked about this with a few supervisors, but um, this, this, this job can burn you out on music. And, and I think you have to be really, really careful. Because um, when you start falling out of love with this, it's all downhill. Wonderful. Well, that's what's been nice about COVID, sorry, that's what's been nice about COVID is just to take some time to slow down and yeah. really nerd out and indulge and, um, and, and get back to your roots of like being a, a freak. I, can I ask a question to the, to the group here? Go for it. Um, I've been going through this weird thing during COVID where I'm almost exclusively listening to stuff I loved in high school. <laughs> 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 like, are you guys kind of in a space where you can listen to whatever you want? Are you gravitating back towards your roots? Or are you in a, in a world of exploration right now? Yeah, I I'm going back to roots. <laughs> my my son's taking guitar lessons, so he wants to learn Beatles songs. So we've just been listening to a lot of Beatles. <laughs> yeah. Here's my COVID favorite thing. Caetano Veloso, Transa. We've been listening to a lot of stuff, um, nostalgic stuff, just to introduce this little wonderful creature to it. So, <laughs> yeah. I've listened to the Scream 2 soundtrack a lot. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's so That's random. what I do in here. That's so random. <laughs> what? I love that movie. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I love it. And I appreciate you all this afternoon for joining myself and the Guild of Music Supervisors. And it was such an incredible discussion. We could have spoken to you for the rest of the, the afternoon, but I'm gonna hand back to Jonathan and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jazz. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Jazz. This is great. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jazz. Jazz. All so much, Jazz. Amazing job as always. Uh, only her third Zoom of the day. <laughs> um, so uh, you guys, thank you again for your time and for everybody tuning in. We'll be doing these uh, weekly and sometimes bi-weekly. Netflix uh, is next week. We'll be talking to Nora Felder from Strange Things, Barry Cole from Living With Yourself, Matt Biffle all the way from the UK talking about the music on sex education, Morgan Rhodes, uh, Self Made, Gabe Hill from Black AF, and Ben Hochstein on my block. And that'll be moderated by Shirley Hopper, music editor of Variety Magazine. So once again, uh, sign up for Friends of the Guild if you want to know more or send it to your friends. We are a nonprofit and uh, we just kind of keep pushing for music supervisors. That's what we do. So on behalf of uh, everybody on the staff, thank you guys so much. Levi, Honor, Angela, uh, thank you. And Jazz, blessings for killing it. Thank Have you, a great everybody. Night. Great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.